Hi, I'm Paul Wadwa from the Barbie Davis Center in uh, Aurora, Colorado from the United States. And today I will be talking about guiding type one diabetes treatment through the islet myonic pancreas. These are my disclosures. So first I'll start with a little bit of background and I want to touch on the results for the recently published myonic pancreas pivotal trial. But I'll spend most of the talk uh, discussing the findings in the pediatric subset of this cohort. And then we'll summarize the findings and I'll briefly touch on uh, some discussion and reflection on the study. So for background, I, I think it's no surprise to this audience that glycemic control globally is not meeting recommendations for most pediatric and adolescent people with type 1 diabetes. The slide here shows you data from the US type one diabetes exchange and the German Austrian DPV registries. And what you see here are adolescents and young adults with the highest levels of A1C compared to the uh, overall population with type one diabetes. And so there's the need for uh, more tools uh, to help these uh, people with their overall glycemic control. When we look at current hybrid closed loop systems there are three hybrid closed loop systems that are now FDA approved for use in the United States. And there are five approved from Europe and there are several under development. But most of these systems require user input and a provider has to help with setting up the pump settings, which include programmed basal rates and bolus settings. And some, some systems require the total daily dose of insulin uh, to be input into the system. When the user starts to use the pump and when they have ongoing use, they must be able to do carbohydrate counting and input the carb amounts for each meal and snack that requires a bolus. The islet bionic pancreas it is an automated insulin delivery system that has been studied for several years in the United States. It requires only the user's body weight to begin working in closed loop mode. It automates insulin dosing after the weight is entered and adapts continuously to the individual's insulin needs. The only setting to adjust is the glucose target. The user can decide how aggressive they want to be with usual targets, lower than usual or higher than usual. And they can adjust those targets for different times of the day. This system is unique in that it does not require carbohydrate counting and only qualitative entry. So the user announces the meal type, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and the meal size is quantified by uh, indicating usual for me, less than usual, or more than usual. I would like to note that the system is still in the research process, is an investigational, investigational device, is not available for commercial use or sale uh, anywhere in the world. So in the islet bionic pancreas, every dose of insulin is determined by the system and cannot be changed by the user. But that also means that the user does not have to enter any correction doses or uh, adjustments for high blood sugar. The pump is designed to function with insulin alone or as a bihormonal system using insulin and glucagon. For today's talk, I'll be focusing just on the insulin only version of the bionic pancreas and we'll spend most of the time talking about the pediatric data. So I will mention that the findings for the randomized control trial were published in the New England Journal at the end of September. And everything that I will discuss today has been published either in that uh, publication or in other publications that are referenced later. The study design is a 13 week randomized controlled trial that was conducted at 16 sites in the United States. The study included 326 pediatric and adult participants aged 6 to 79 years who had type 1 diabetes for at least one year. There was a 2 to 1 randomization to bionic pancreas or standard care. All uh, participants in the data that I will present today used Aspart or Lispro and the bionic pancreas. And as I mentioned before, the bionic pancreas group used qualitative meal announcements 
announcing either usual, more than usual, or less than usual uh, amount of carbohydrates in the meal that they would eat. And they identified the meal type as breakfast, lunch, or dinner. This study was funded by the uh, National Institutes of Health uh, with the, from the NIDDK Institute. And the principal investigators were Ed Damiano, Roy Beck, Faraz al Khatib, and Stephen Russell. Supplies were provided by Beta Bionics, and insulin was supplied by Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly. This busy schematic um, shows you how uh, participants were randomized. So to begin with, uh, participants needed to have baseline CGM data. And then, as I mentioned, the uh, pediatric participants were randomized two to one to bionic pancreas or standard care. The 275 adults were actually randomized to bionic pancreas standard care or a group that used FIASP or ultra rapid um, Novolog. And those uh, findings were uh, published in a separate publication that I will not be discussing today. We will discuss the bionic pancreas compared to standard care. And as I mentioned, uh, we will focus on the pediatric cohort here. Uh, the adult cohort here and the FIAS cohort were published in uh, Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics. So all participants uh, either had previous use of the Dexcom G6 CGM or they underwent a two-week blinded CGM period prior to randomization. They were then block randomized two to one to bionic pancreas or standard care. Participants in the standard care arm uh, used uh, multiple daily injections, open loop pump, hybrid closed loop pump, uh, but all of them were required to use unblinded Dexcom G6 uh, as their CGM. The bionic pancreas group was trained to use the islet insulin pump with a bionic pancreas algorithm and the Dexcom G6 CGM. They used inset infusion sets, and they started with a default target for blood glucose of 120 milligrams per deciliter, but they could adjust that to lower or higher targets as they desired. And as I mentioned, they used qualitative meal announcements, and that uh, allowed the system to deliver 75% of the estimated insulin dose immediately, and then the remainder of the insulin uh, requirements uh, after that. There were no manual glucose correction boluses given through that system. Study visits included the baseline visit, and for the bionic pancreas group, that included training on how to use the islet bionic pancreas. This was followed by phone follow-up within 48 hours after the initial visit, and then uh, visits at 2, 6, 10, and 13 weeks, and those can be conducted in person or via video conference if necessary, uh, because these were visits were conducted during the pandemic. Central lab hemoglobin A1C values were obtained at randomization, six and 13 weeks. So this is a listing of the publications from this initial uh, randomized control trial. Uh, the New England Journal article has the main findings. Uh, this article um, on the left um, for Messer and colleagues is the uh, pediatric publication and the references are lifted here on the, on the lower left of this slide. Uh, and then the other three that were published uh, focus on different aspects of the study, and these are provided here for your reference if you're interested. So for the statistical analysis, the primary outcome was glycemic control as assessed by hemoglobin A1C. The key secondary outcome was percent CGM time below 54 milligrams per deciliter, and the analysis for the secondary outcomes was done with a hierarchic analysis, meaning if the um, analysis for that variable, the top variable was considered significant, then the analysis continued to the next variable and so on. But at any point if the analysis showed an, a non-statistical difference, then the analysis stopped and the remainder of the variables were not analyzed. Safety outcomes include incidents of severe hypoglycemia, DKA and other serious events. Uh, we used an intention to treat analysis, and there is a linear mixed effects regression models adjusting for baseline values, age, and clinical site. 
So here are the results for the main study. And the primary outcome shows that at baseline, um, the two groups, uh, the bionic pancreas group and the green are the left-hand solid bars and the graph in the, in the upper portion of the slide um, compared to the standard care had A1C levels of 7.9 or 7.7. And then at 13 weeks, the group using bionic pancreas had a mean A1C decrease down to 7.3% compared to 7.7%, so essentially the same in the standard care group. And the adjusted difference was 0.5%, which was both statistically and clinically significant. In the graph on the lower half of the of the slide here, what you see is that H, HbA1c lowering was most pronounced in those with higher baseline A1c. So on the x-axis, we have baseline A1c levels, and on the y-axis, you have a change in A1c. And what you can see is those with highest baseline A1cs using bionic pancreas had a more profound lowering in their A1c during the study period. When we look at the secondary outcomes, you see all of the analysis here, and I'll give you the highlights in that um, the time less than 54 milligrams per deciliter in hypoglycemia was not inferior because there was a very low amount of hypoglycemia in both bionic pancreas and standard care uh, groups. The difference in mean glucose was statistically significant, as was time and range. Time and range increased to 65% and the bionic pancreas group compared to 54% in standard care. And the time in hyperglycemia and the glucose standard deviation, those were all significant. There was no significant difference in time in hypoglycemia less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, again, likely due to the low rates of hypoglycemia in the entire cohort. I'm now going to shift to the pediatric results. So here you see the randomization. There were 165 pediatric participants, 53 were randomized to standard care, and 112 randomized to bionic pancreas using uh, either Aspart or Lispro. And what you see here is that all of the participants uh, randomized in the study completed the study. These are the descriptors of the pediatric cohort. There was a mean age of 12 years, mean duration six years, 65% non-Hispanic white, uh, and you can see the uh, descriptors for parental education and BMI percentage. At baseline, 95% of the cohort were already using CGM. Uh, about a third were using injections, uh, and the rest were using uh, insulin pumps. And what I'm showing you here is about a fourth of the cohort were already using hybrid closed-loop systems with just under 20% using tandem control IQ and the rest using Medtronic hybrid closed loop systems, either 670 or 770, as the 780G is not available in the US at this time. Here you see baseline A1Cs, and what I wanna show you is there was a fairly wide range at baseline, ranging from 5.8 to 12.2%, but the majority had a, a starting A1C levels over 8%. I'll now shift to the results at 13 weeks. In the next couple of slides, what you'll see is that standard care uh, is described on the left and bionic pancreas on the right. Baseline is in red and the 13 weeks are in blue. And what you see here as a mean A1C decrease of 0.5% um, in the bionic pancreas group and an, and an adjusted difference of 0.5% which again was statistically significant. <clears throat> it's important to note that a much larger percentage of the bionic pancreas group had an improvement of A1C of, of more than 0.5% at 51% versus 8%. And when we look at the improvement by um, 1%, we see about a third of bionic pancreas had uh, that level of change. Another way to look at this is by the distribution of the A1Cs. So if we look at the standard care group, which you see is really not much of a change. When we look on the other side, when we look at the bionic pancreas group, what we see in the red is that um, you see a similar distribution to the standard care group, 
But at 13 weeks, what we see is that that distribution or the curve narrows quite a bit. And that means that those with starting higher A1Cs had really a pretty dramatic reduction in their A1C levels over the 13 weeks of the study, um, which led to a much tighter distribution here at 13 weeks with a mean of 7.5. Again, another way to look at this is the starting A1C on the um, x-axis. We see the change from the baseline A1C to 13 weeks on the y-axis, what you see is really a profound reduction um, and with people starting with higher A1Cs um, compared to a smaller reduction and those with A1C levels uh, closer to target range. When we look at mean A1C by insulin delivery, what we see is that those on manic pancreas finish the study with similar A1Cs, regardless if they started on injections, on open loop pumps or closed loop pumps. And when we look at the change in time and range, what we see is that the change happened fairly quickly over the course of the study with um, most participants in the bionic pancreas group reaching time and range at 60% or above within the first week of using the system. So the automation ramped up fairly quickly and then they maintain that level of time and range through the course of the study. Again, there is no difference in time and hypoglycemia, most likely due to uh, low levels of hypoglycemia for the whole cohort. When we look at mean glucose, we see a significant difference when we compare standard care versus bionic pancreas. But what I want you to see is that when we look at the mean glucose by time of day, you really see the most pronounced differences overnight. So really quite impressive, tight control overnight, and then some differences during the rest of the day. When we look at the subset of participants uh, who had starting baseline A1Cs over 9%, um, 27 participants in the binary pancreas group, only seven in standard care. So relatively small amount but you see really pretty dramatic differences um, in A1C, time and range, mean glucose, and time with hyperglycemia over 250 when we compare these participants. In the time over 250, the difference is a, a total of about seven hours per day, which again is really quite dramatic. When we look at total daily insulin, uh, weight and body mass index, there really wasn't much to see. And with use of bionic pancreas, the, the uh, change in total daily dose of insulin did not vary with the change in A1C. And what I'm not showing on this table, uh, but was found in the study, was that there was no significant difference in body weight or BMI. In terms of adverse events, there were a few participants with severe hypoglycemia. There were no events of DKA in this cohort. Um, there were several events of hyperglycemia, most but not all were associated with infusion set failures in the bionic pancreas group. However, the failure rate of 3% um, for over 3,000 infusion sets is relatively low when you compare it to other studies. So in summary, both in the overall cohort and in the pediatric subset, there was a significant decrease in A1C, significant decrease in mean glucose, and a significant increase in time and target range. There were no significant differences in hypoglycemia or adverse events in the bionic pancreas group compared to the standard care group. It's important to note that improvements started within the first days after starting the system, and the largest decreases in A1C were observed in those who had the highest levels of baseline A1C and the highest rates of baseline hyperglycemia. The changes observed in the glycemic control are similar to other recently published hybrid closed studies in this age group. So if we look at a comparison here from studies of tandem control IQ, the Omnipod 5, and uh, Dr. Havorka's CAM APS system, what we see, um, even though the study periods differed quite a bit and the age ranges were not quite the same, is that the time and range increase was 
very similar to the other studies. And again, the A1C changes was also very similar to uh, other studies of other hybrid closed loop systems. But the difference here is bionic pancreas um, is, has some really fundamental differences in the design. It does not require programmed basal rates or bolus settings. It does not require the user to uh, do carbohydrate counting or manual correction boluses. And there are no required adjustments in basal rates or bolus settings uh, by the provider during the follow-up. So for a patient or even a provider who wants options with less interaction and a more simpler interface, um, this may be a good option. So if we look at the remote controls on the right, what we see is a, a more sophisticated or, or a control with um, more options shown here versus a much simpler remote control. So if there's somebody who desires a, a more simple interface, then the bionic pancreas may be the right fit for them. Some disclaimers. Again, I want to remind the audience that bionic pancreas is not currently available for commercial use anywhere in the world. The company producing this system um, is planning for review by the FDA uh, with hopes of having a commercially available insulin-only bionic pancreas available for use in the United States sometime in the future. We did not discuss the bihormonal, the bihormonal bionic pancreas in this presentation, and further work is certainly needed um, to determine uh, if and when that system would be ready for commercial use. While the cur current data demonstrate the potential for this system, um, the implications for international use is unclear at this time. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge all of the study sites listed here with the principal investigators for each site. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the sponsors for this study, the study participants and their family, and the uh, investigators and the staff uh, who conducted the study. So appreciate the support from all of those involved. Thank you.